you know, money is really just a social agreement, or maybe more accurately, it's a set of social agreements, which relate to each other, and which I therefore call a story, a story that uh, assigns meaning to symbols. Uh, it's a set of interpretations. It assigns meaning to symbols. It directs human attention. It uh, creates roles for human beings. Uh, it assigns value and importance to things. So, it's, so I, I say that money, you could look at money as a story, and it's not a story that exists in isolation, but it's embedded in larger stories, the defining myths of our culture. One of those I just described is the story of ascent, the story of growth, the conquest of nature. Uh, the other that money very deeply embodies <coughs> is, <coughs> excuse me, the story of separation, which is a very deep cultural myth. <coughs> uh, every story has, every, every culture has a different answer to the question, who are you? And ours answers that by saying, well, what you are is this discrete, separate being uh, in an external universe that's also separate from you, um, among other beings who are separate from you. And you are therefore fundamentally in competition with, each other, with these other beings because they're separate from you. So more for somebody else is less for you. Biology says yes. And this competition is driven by our genes, which program us to maximize our reproductive self-interest. Economics says pretty much the same thing. Um, and even religion affirms that basic conception of self, at least, you know, maybe esoteric religions uh, have a more sophisticated understanding, but, but in general, the idea that you get from religion is that you are this soul encased in flesh, and um, there's other souls out there, and then there's God up there, you know, and, and so you're separate. And that's another story or myth that is becoming obsolete. Uh, and, and today, we're coming into a new understanding of what it is to be. That being isn't a monadic predicate, you know, but that being is, is a function of relationship. So that who I am is the set of all of my relationships, which means that there's something in, in me of all of you and something of all of you in me, and, and every being on the planet is part of me in some way. This understanding is, is infiltrating science. Um, for example, even in physics, uh, the self-other distinction, the observer-observed distinction is no longer so clear that you know even that this distinction is even valid. It's no longer so clear. Uh, in biology, they're they're discovering just how much genes are shared across individual and species boundaries. Uh, how evolution happens through the merger of simpler organisms and through through uh, gene horizontal gene transfer. And in ecology, they're understanding that that it's just not true that more for you is less for me necessarily. That if you take away the competitor of a certain species, if you eliminate a species, then everybody is worse off. Now, this, and, and so our money system, though, is based on separation, and it enforces separation. It, it destroys community, and it tears people apart from each other. And again, one of the main ways that that happens uh, is through the dynamics of how money is created and how it circulates as interest-bearing debt. And I think I will explain a little bit about that dynamic, um, but I'd like to also just reflect on one of the, on, on that first comment um, that on Salt Spring Island there's there is community, and if you look at, at what what that is you'll probably find that community involves things that people do for each other without paying for it. So, I don't know, like maybe 
uh, you hear that your neighbor needs help of some sort. And so you go over um, and, I don't know, maybe your neighbor's fixing his roof, you know, and you go over and you help with that project. And um, I'm not sure the kind of things that people do for each other on Salt Spring Island. Uh, but anytime you do something and you don't, and, and you know, like, so say your neighbor comes and, and you're doing some kind of project, you know, and your neighbor comes and helps out and, or you say you help out your neighbor, okay? You go over and your neighbor's busy with something and you need someone to hold the ladder and you help out, you know, and you spend, spend a little while doing that. And then your neighbor says, how much do I owe you for that? Like, you'd be kind of insulted, wouldn't you? Or maybe you're, you're watching your neighbor's kids after school and they have a snack at your house and then they go out to play and your neighbor comes over and says, well, you watched my kids for 90 minutes. How much do I owe you for that? Like, that's, it's, it's not really neighborly. And really what's happening there, by offering that payment or by making a payment, your neighbor would be saying, I don't want to owe you one. I don't want to have a tie to you. I want to have our accounts be even. So you don't owe me anything and I don't owe you anything. And that's what a financial transaction does. It, it prevents there from being an ongoing tie. Whereas if you help your neighbor out, then tomorrow or next week, you're going to feel more free to ask your neighbor for help. And your neighbor is going to feel the desire to help you also. So there's, there's this kind of um, mix of obligation and gratitude in community. Community has been defined by David Graeber as, as, as a group of people, and all of them owe each other something. They're all in debt to each other. When these bonds um, that come through gift relationships, like I just described, are replaced by monetary bonds, then there's no community. And some places are, are fortunate uh, to have escaped some of the conversion of life into money. Uh, where I live, there's almost no community at all. People pay for pretty much everything. And if you help a neighbor out, it's kind of uncomfortable. Because they're like, well, why are you doing this? And now, what are you going to ask for? So we've pretty much lost community in a lot of places. And I think I'll, I'll just describe a little bit. Okay, well, I'll describe um, a little bit of the money mechanics about, uh, of how this comes to be. But first, I just really want to observe that these two basic paradigms, these myths of separation and ascent, the conquest of nature, they're both becoming obsolete. And the obsolescence of these myths is visible not only in our changing consciousness, uh, you know, they just don't resonate with us anymore, but also in the disintegration of the institutions that are built on those myths, which is pretty much every institution of our civilization. And we're seeing them all fall apart at the same time. And I think that the reason why they're falling apart at the same time is that they're based on a common, common root, common foundation. So we see crisis everywhere we look. Um, the ecological crisis would be number one. But of course, there's an energy crisis, a soil crisis, a water crisis, healthcare crisis, political crisis, crisis in education. In, in almost any realm you look at, there's a crisis. The, the, the big picture that I, that I work with is to see these crises as kind of a birth crisis or a coming of age crisis that is propelling humanity uh, into a new story or new stories that replace the old stories of separation and ascent. And the new stories, of course, are the connected self. And co-creative partnership with with Earth. We don't yet have institutions that are built on these new stories. Our our consciousness has shifted, 
in various ways, in to varying degrees, in different people, even the people out there who don't get it, you know, quote unquote, and who are driving their SUVs around, you know, and voting for Republicans. Like, I, I find it that, I find that when I get to know them, they do get it in a certain way, maybe even a way that I don't. I find that, that this uh, transition into a new story of the people and a new story of the self is a collective transition that no person can make by themselves, but that we require a community to do it. Uh, and maybe I'll talk more about that later. Uh, but I just want to point out that, that we are in a transition that the old world is dissolving. Uh, and certainly the money crisis is part of this dissolution. So I'll, I'll describe a little bit about um, what's happening with the money crisis. Um, so so, how, so it, 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 it originates in how money is created in our system. Many people understand how money is created today. Ten years ago, no. Ten years ago, people thought that the government printed it or something like that. Uh, but today, a lot of people understand that money is created through lending. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but there's basically two levels of money creation. One is when the central bank or the Federal Reserve uh, buys securities on the open market and it doesn't take money from somewhere else to buy those securities, but it creates new money with the stroke of a pen or actually a keyboard. And that's new money. And corresponding to that money, they, they, now they have another asset on their balance sheet, when they, which they buy with that new money. And that asset is worth more than the amount of money they created because it's an interest-bearing asset. For example, a mortgage-backed security or a government bond. Okay, same thing, same basic thing happens when a bank creates the kind of money that you and I use. You go to the bank, you get a loan, and essentially that money is created um, out of thin air uh, through some keystrokes. They don't transfer money from somewhere else, they type that amount into your account, a million dollars, okay? So there's maybe 70 people in this room that I'm talking to, and so say I'm a bank, and I lend everybody in the room a million dollars. And it's an interest, right? So everybody in the room owes me, let's say, $2 million. Maybe it's a 10-year loan, at 7% interest to pay. Everyone owes me $2 million. Now, how, so think, how are you going to give me $2 million back when I only lent you a million dollars? Well, maybe it's not a problem because you have a great business plan and you're going to manufacture widgets because you know that everybody in the room would just love a widget and you're going to manufacture widgets and sell them to everybody and they're going to pay you money and you're going to make $3 million. You're going to pay me back my $2 million and you're going to be rich too. Great. No problem. The problem, problem number one, comes because everybody in the room is in the same boat. Everybody has a million dollars and owes me $2 million. So you see a problem there? Where does the extra money come from? Half of you are going to have to go bankrupt. If that were all to the story, half of you would have to go bankrupt. So basically that means that you're all in competition with each other for never enough money. Competition and scarcity are built into the system. So that's one way that the money system embodies the myth of separation. It, it makes us see each other as these others, these competitors. So that your bad fortune, that's good fortune for me. If you can't compete anymore, then that's my good luck. And if you're doing really well, that's less for me, which is the opposite of an ancient hunter-gatherer economy. 
which was a gift economy, in which if you had more than you needed, you'd share it with somebody else, because that's where social status came from and security. Because the more you shared, the more people would want to take care of you too. So in that society, somebody else's good fortune is your good fortune too, because they'll have more to share. Somebody's bad fortune is your bad fortune too. Okay, so it's a very different worldview, uh, and that that's built into uh, a different economy. But what we live in reinforces the worldview of separation, even if on some heart level we know better. Our institutions deny what we know in our hearts, especially the institution of money. As you may have experienced many, many times, when you have some generous impulse and you want to share with somebody, and, and then there's that voice, well, can I afford it? What about me? Okay. So everybody owes me $2 million. And that means half of you are going to go bankrupt unless more money comes in somehow. And that's what happens. Everybody doesn't have to, half of you don't have to go bankrupt because by the time those loans come due, I will have lent even more money into existence, enough to pay most of those loans. And maybe a few of you do go bankrupt, but that's because you are very lazy and we want to weed you out anyway. All right, so the system kind of works, right? As long as I'm lending even more money into existence, it works. But of course, that more money comes with even more debt. So how are you going to pay that? Well, when that comes due, I will have lent even more money, more and more and more. So the system actually works as long as the amount of money grows forever. Now, how, how am I going to lend you more money? Who am I going to lend it to? I'm going to lend it to those of you who are going to build even more widget factories and, and sell something. You have to be able to make more money or work for somebody who's going to sell new things. Uh, so the money goes to those who are creating new goods and services. So the system works as long as the realm of goods and services keeps expanding. And that means that as long as we can find more of nature to turn into products and more of these gift relationships to turn into services, then the system works. What happens, though, when growth slows down? Well, then I can't lend on the bank. I can't lend new money into existence because no one has a good business plan now. Right? Um, um, right? There's not enough good business plans for me to lend enough money. So the debts then rise faster than the amount of, of goods and services, the amount of income. And that's what we see happening today. And that creates pressure to somehow squeeze a little bit more growth out of the planet or out of society. It's obvious to many people that we're reaching the ecological limits of growth. What's a little less obvious is that we're also reaching the social limits of growth. The, the, we're reaching limits to the um, potential growth in services. Because service is essentially something that people used to do for each other for themselves or for each other without paying for it, and now they pay for it. Uh, for example, um, communication. That was once something no one paid for uh, because we didn't have the technology to uh, do long distance communication and you know, didn't have technology that required specialists and a division of labor and so forth. So you didn't pay for communication. Uh, you didn't pay for um, even one generation ago People didn't pay for childcare very much. When I was a kid, that was a rarity uh, to pay for childcare. Um, people, mothers mostly, looked after their kids, and if both parents worked, then the neighbors would wash them after school. You know, and the neighborhood kind of took care of the kids. People rarely paid for food preparation. There wasn't a deli in the supermarket. You had to go and buy stuff, and like mom cooked. So. Food preparation wasn't a service. A few more generations back, um, entertainment wasn't something people usually paid for. They would get together. All the old farmhouses here have piano rooms. People, or, or you read uh, 
Jane Austen, you know, and after dinner, they all get together and someone plays a piano and shows off her accomplishments, you know, and, and so they're creating every band, every town of 10,000 people had a marching band and it was a big deal, like the town band. So people would get together and create fun for themselves, recreation. There wasn't something you bought and there weren't gyms. Exercise wasn't something you paid for, okay? Um, so, and go back a few more generations, medicine wasn't something that you usually paid for. Every village had some grandmothers who knew a lot about herbs and, and only in rare circumstances might you have to invite the doctor with his little black bag. Um, education wasn't something that you paid for. People learned by um, uh, hanging out with adults and, and imitating adults. Um, clothing, a shelter, everyone knew how to build a house. And people got together and built houses for each other, food. So the farther back you go, the fewer things people paid for. Peasants in medieval Europe used money for very little. And I don't mean to idealize this. All I'm saying is that, is that we've reached the point today where there's almost nothing left. And maybe Salt Spring Island is different. Maybe if your plumbing breaks down, you don't call a plumber, but you have a neighbor who can do that. Um, but here, where I live, and increasingly everywhere, we pay for almost everything. Until there's almost nothing left that people do for themselves. It, it reaches extremes where even things like like wise advice from someone you trust, like we don't have that anymore. So we hire psychologists and life coaches and things like that. Um, and so what this means, these, these two limits, the ecological limits of growth, you know, we can't increase the number of board feet of lumber that we harvest every year. We can't increase the fish catch, you know, we can't increase the number of barrels of oil um, and the social limits that I talked about. We're, we, these together are causing a crisis in the money system that will not go away and cannot go away because the money system only works if there's growth because only then can people continue to service their debts. This crisis for me is good news. Um, because it's giving us the opportunity to create something different. People, human beings don't usually change unless, unless in some sense the world falls apart, unless there's a big breakdown in their lives. And I think that societies are the same way. And that's what we're facing today. Um, is there anything else I want to say about that? Well, we could maintain growth a little longer if we try hard. It's just a matter of finding something that hasn't been converted to money yet. For example, here in Pennsylvania, you know, there's still a lot of uh, drinkable water. Um, and we can uh, produce more natural gas by fracking which will destroy the drinking water. Um, so you could say that that's a way of converting a little bit more of nature into money, but it comes at a very high cost. You know, we can, we can continue cutting down the Amazon, converting those trees into money, but we recognize that it's coming at a very high cost. And it's really a matter of how long do we want to keep it going. And if you look at the political discourse, the politicians, the policymakers do not yet understand that we've reached the limits of growth. I don't care if it's, if it's Paul Krugman or uh, the neoliberals, you know, they're all saying we have to find a way to get the economy growing again. Even with their efforts, though, economic growth is still slowing down. And that's why the financial crisis isn't going away. The debts just get shifted from one place to another. Um, and we'll have one debt crisis after another until we 
change the system on a deeper level. And that's what my book is about. You know, I, I, I kind of have given you a big picture thing. Uh, I haven't talked that much yet about the new stories, and I, I, I can. Um, but the big picture is basically, well, I just gave you the big picture. And then in the book, I also write a lot about uh, what, what would money look like exactly if it embodied the uh, story of the connected self and co-creative partnership with nature and the healing of nature? What would money look like then if it embodied these values, if, if we forged a different set of agreements? What would that look like? How, how would we do that? And how would we make the transition? 